All right, we are live and we are good. Hello, my people. Welcome to the SCORE channel. It's a pleasure to see you again. I'm gonna give you tips today to help you crush the speaking part of the Duolingo test. Trust me, if you apply these tips, your score will improve. I can 100% guarantee it. Like, it's not just about your speaking ability, it's about how you approach a test. That, that, there's two different things. There's test skills and there's English skills. So if you've been using your English skills to the max and you're still not getting higher scores, maybe this stuff will help you, okay? I can't make you a better English speaker overnight, but I can show you how to use the test to your advantage and how to really work the different exercises that it asks you to do. We're gonna be going through three different types of exercises because that's what you see on the Duolingo test. They got three basic speaking tasks. The first ones ask you to describe images. The second one will give you a written prompt that you have to then you know, answer and develop. And finally, you're gonna have ones where you listen and then give an answer. Okay, so we're gonna go through all three of those today and I'm gonna show you how it goes. Now, if you're re-watching this, if, you're, if I make a super cut of this later or you're watching this whole live thing later, I would recommend that once I show you a new task or once you hear the audio for the task, you pause and try to do it yourself, okay? And then you can hear how I do it. And that way you get an idea of like, you know, maybe how yours should be. The images, okay? And I'm gonna give you a little formula that you can use to handle image descriptions. All right, it's very straightforward, okay? Just remember dad, that's all you gotta do, okay? Dad, I don't have one, but it's fine, doesn't bother me. Dad is an acronym, stands for three things. First, describe, okay? This is where you're gonna bust out your vocabulary, especially your adjectives and your verbs. Then we're gonna analyze, okay? We're gonna go a little bit deeper and start asking why. Why are these things happening? Finally, I wanna develop this stuff, okay? So that's the D-A-D, that's dad. Describe, analyze, and develop. Develop means that you're gonna speculate. You're gonna think about what might happen, what could happen, okay? What are the possibilities? Again, this shows off other English structures. It shows off your other skills. All right, let's do it. All right, I'm gonna start my timer. I'm gonna start by describing. Voice projection, Franco, exactly. Okay, so I wanna start by describing this picture. Uh, so in this picture, we see, looks like two guys and a younger person in a boat. It's a wooden boat on a maybe a lake or a big river. This is a cloudy day. It's kind of hard to see where we are, but it looks like it could be the jungle. It's very remote. There's no civilization here. And I can see that there's just green in the background, some foliage, some trees, but that's about it. It's just gray water, gray skies and trees. The, the boat is pretty small. It seems that maybe it could hold six or seven people, but right now there's these three here and there's the guy in the back operating a motor and looks like the guy in the middle who happens to look a lot like yours truly is holding a beer. And uh, so these guys might be tourists. They could be here to uh, explore this area. They kind of look like tourists because these two guys look pretty different from the guy in the back. So I think that it's they probably came here to explore, go on an adventure. And maybe these two guys are friends or brothers that are traveling together and just wanted to go to somewhere new and see something different. It looks like they're having a good time. Like they seem to be having fun. They're smiling and enjoying their trip. And uh, obviously you're going to have more fun if you have a beer in your hands. So that's cool. And it seems like a relatively cool place to go. It's hard to say exactly where they might be going. Maybe they're heading to some other location in the jungle for like a walk. Or maybe they're going back to a lodge or a resort where they're going to stay for the night. I don't know exactly where they're going here, but it looks like they're having a good time doing it. Let's see what we got. Okay, in this picture, I see a man and a woman. They seem to be talking. It's hard to tell what kind of conversation this is. I think it could be an argument because she's pointing to herself and she looks like she's a little bit upset. And the man's posture, he's got his arms folded and... He doesn't seem to be smiling or too happy, so maybe they're having a fight or an argument. However, the location is very nice and pretty. Like, I see a lot of flowers in the background. I see a lot of trees in the background. And there's a bag there also in the middle of the picture that 
says tambo de Takama. So maybe this is like a restaurant or like a touristy place and they bought something there. So maybe these two are a couple and they could be visiting this place together and maybe they're talking about their experience at this place or they're discussing some issue that they had on this part of the trip. I also can tell that like these two probably traveled together. I can see that they, you know, they seem to be carrying bags. I can see the girl has a bag over her shoulder and given he does also, they're probably travelers or tourists. So I don't know exactly where this could be, but I also see in the background something that looks like a machine that's like maybe presses down on stuff. So maybe this is like a vineyard or a winery or like some sort of distillery or something that could be uh, because I see that corkscrew shaped thing in the back and I don't know exactly what that's for, but it could be like an old press or something. So it looks like a very beautiful place to spend a day. I would certainly like to spend a day here. You've got a lot of beautiful scenery and uh, could be a lot of fun. Okay, here we go. Okay, in this picture, it seems that we have a street that has some normal cars, but it also has go-karts. And we see like five or six red go-karts in front of the other cars. And there are some, a lot of lights. This looks like a nighttime scene. And there's some symbols on these signs. So maybe this is China or Japan. Based on the type of letters I see on the sign in the background and in the business back there. And then we see that the people in these carts are wearing some funny costumes. One of them looks like a Pikachu. Somebody else looks like Tigger from Winnie the Pooh. I don't know what these other ones are, but they're wearing like strange costumes or clothes. And they look like they're having a lot of fun. They're smiling and they're... You know, they're getting ready to drive their go-karts on what appears to be a normal street. So I think that maybe this is some kind of activity you can do in this place. Like maybe you can rent go-karts and do a tour around the city, even though I wouldn't think you could do that because this is like a normal road. And I don't I didn't know go-karts could drive on the same road. That seems weird. Maybe these guys are part of some sort of like tour group or a club that drives their go-karts around. I don't know. But this looks like a lot of fun. And it looks also like it's pretty safe because they don't seem very worried. They're not wearing any helmets. Like they must not be too concerned about getting hit by a car because they're just in the main street with go-karts. So this looks like a lot of fun. And I'm wondering if I can do this because this looks like a great time. I would like to try this. So in this picture, I see an older Japanese man. He's wearing a traditional blue robe, it seems. Underneath that, he has like a sweater and more common clothes. He's got two pairs of glasses, so that must help him see what he's doing really well. He's looks like he's painting a paper lantern. I think that's what those are. Those are paper lanterns, which are really traditional in Asia. And it looks like he also has on his desk some drawings or patterns that maybe he uses to, to copy those onto the lanterns. He also has some different pencils and pens and an eraser and some ink. So he seems to be applying the ink now directly to this paper lantern. I can see that he's very, very concentrated. Like he's really focused on what he's doing. His movement seems very deliberate and precise. He's again with two pairs of glasses. He must be really focused. You know, he's <laughs> he's really concentrated on what he's trying to do. So this could be his job. Maybe like this is what he does is he makes these paper lanterns and he sells them. So he wants them to be really good. Maybe this is something that he's just doing as a demonstration, like to show other people how to make these lanterns and what they're for. So I think that this is just something that is like a hobby for him and he probably does it and really feels good about doing it. I think this is something he obviously really likes to do because he seems very lost in what he's doing, like almost like he's in a trance or in the zone. And I know that I get that way when I do creative stuff too. So I imagine he really enjoys this work and he probably can make some good extra money by selling those lanterns. I was going to buy one, but 
I didn't know if I could bring it back safely. The written tasks are basically where you're going to get it like this. Okay. They're very, very much the same as speaking part two of IELTS. If anybody's preparing for IELTS and they also want to practice this part, this is it. Like this is your moment. Okay. Pay attention. If you guys are doing the Duolingo, do I, I can't, I never can say it right. Duolingo English test. I always want to say duo English. I just want to mute, merge the words together. If you're doing the Duolingo test, this, then they also have speaking parts that are identical to IELTS part two. And they're so identical that I literally just took IELTS prompts and put them in here. Like they're hundred percent the same. I'm gonna show you an example of one of these and, and show you how to do it, but it's very simple. All you gotta do is follow the points. They're gonna give you three or four things that you have to do. There's like a central command or prompt. And then there's like three or four little sub things that you gotta do. Okay, very, very easy to do it. All you gotta do is follow the points and if you still have time, tell a story. That's it, tell a story. Because you can go on and on with your story until the end of time, until it cuts you off. If you get cut off, it's okay. You don't have to have a perfectly neatly wrapped conclusion to finish this part of the test. Just talk, okay? Follow the points and then tell your story. Let's do this. Okay, so I'm gonna read this real quick. Describe an activity that you like to do in your free time, after work, or study. And you should say what you do, where you do it, when you do it, who you do it with. Explain why you like to do this activity. Um, so I'm just gonna go through these points and I'm gonna tell a story at the end, okay? So something that I like to do after I finish work or whenever I have some free time is play Rocket League. Rocket League is a video game that you can play on consoles and on your PC. It's basically car soccer. So you take a car and you hit a ball and you try to put the ball on the goal uh, so it's a game that I play at home. Like I play it on my computer sitting right here at my desk and I usually get to play Rocket League in the evenings, not every day of the week because I sometimes have way too much work to do, but I try to play a little bit every week. Usually like Friday night is a good night for me to play Rocket League, maybe like weekends during the day. So it depends on how much work I have to do. And if I have like a lot of things to do, then I don't play it in anything, but I try. Um, I used to play this game all by myself. I never played with other people. I've always been like a solo gamer. And then more recently, I started playing with random people online. I would like play the game online. And if I was connecting really well with somebody, I started asking them to keep playing with me. And then I've actually got into a couple of groups on Discord, which is like an app that people use to communicate when they play video games. So on Discord, I get to like talk to these people live. So we, we talk to each other, we tell jokes, we laugh while we're playing the game. Um, I like to do it just because it's so challenging. Like it's a game where you could spend thousands of hours and still not be good. And there's still people better than you that can do more amazing things than you. Like I can think of times where I have pulled off these amazing highlight plays that just are incredible and mind blowing. Like this one time I hit this double tap off the backboard right into the goal as the time expired to win the game for my team. And those moments are just so amazing. Like it's one of the best feelings in the world. Let's do another. Let's keep it going. I'm feeling it. I'm on a roll. All right, describe a problem that affects the environment in the area where you live. So a major problem that affects my area, which is Lima, Peru, I believe it is littering or th when people throw trash into the street instead of putting it in a trash can or disposing of it correctly. Littering, I think, is a major issue in Peru. There are several reasons why it's a big problem here. I think that one of the causes is just people not caring. I think a lot of people have a bad education. They don't think that it's a problem. And they also assume that someone else will take care of it because there are people that the city pays to clean up the streets, you know, and you can see these people very early in the morning at six in the morning, sweeping the street and picking up trash. And so I think a lot of people just go, oh, well, if I throw some trash out of my car, those people will pick it up. And so I think that's why a lot of people don't feel like it's a big problem. I think a lot of people just assume that it's normal to do that. 
And so I think that that's the main cause. And I think that's the reason why a lot of people don't like it. But then there's also a lot of people that feel like it's not an issue. And so they keep perpetuating the problem. So I think that there's a few things that need to be done to solve this. First of all, I think we should really punish people hard when they do this because they will do it very openly. I've seen people sitting at a red light just throw a cup outside the window and nobody does anything. And I think that as a society, we should start by being like responsible. If I see somebody throw trash in the street, I pick it up and throw it back in their car. I throw it back in their window. And it's like, no, you want to throw stuff in the street? I throw it on you. Okay. And then like, you know, I think we should have the police punishing these people way more severely. There should be fines. There should be penalties for people who do this. I think you should lose your license if you keep throwing trash out of your window. It's unacceptable behavior. And in my opinion, the only way to get it done is to like, you know, eliminate people with punishments. One more. I got one more of these. Let's go. Describe an object you own that is important to you. Okay. So I don't have a lot of important possessions. I have things that obviously are very important to like my day-to-day -day life and my work, but there's one thing in particular that is very important to me, and that is my gavel right here. Uh, this is the award you get when you win best delegate in a model United Nations conference. And I received it when I won Harvard National Model United Nations Latin America 2018. And so this was given to me by the director after I won that competition. And that was an extremely satisfying moment. I don't use this really. I don't like bring this out very often. I do sometimes to show off and show people like, hey, I got a masito, I got a gavel, uh, deal with it. But um, I generally just keep it right here in my desk and it's here at all times, not for any real reason, just because it's important to me. And it's important to me because there's a couple reasons. One is it reflects the hard work that I put in for that event. Like I busted my butt to really win that event. It was probably the hardest I've ever prepared for anything ever. And I spent the better part of four days doing this event and working really hard and staying up all night to get the win. And it felt really good to get that win. And also because the year before that, I went to an MUN event and it didn't work out well. I got kicked out of the conference and it was one of the worst experiences ever. So for me to get this the year after that happened was like so significant for me. It was just one of those moments where I felt like justice had been served. I went from being the delegate that was expelled from a conference to being the best in the conference. And that was a pretty wild moment. And it was also really nice because a lot of cool people were there supporting me and I'll never forget it. Boom. The Duolingo test has the same kind of exercise. It has an exercise where you get an audio and answer a question and that's it. Okay. You can replay the audio twice. It will start playing when you advance to that question. So let's say you were doing a writing task and you just finish your writing task and then you hit next. It will start playing that audio immediately on the Duolingo test. So you're gonna lose one of your listens right away and you're probably not gonna be prepared for it. So you're gonna need to, you know, hear it again. I would recommend listening to it again before you start. The thing to understand is that you can only record your answer once. So if you start hitting record, that's it. You can't go back and hear the audio again. You can't stop in the middle and be like, oh wait, I should have listened to that again. Let me do that. No. That's it. Like once you hit record, you are locked in. On the TOEFL, you don't even get to replay the audio, but it doesn't start right away. So you just, when you're ready, you hit the button, you hear it once, you answer the question. So in that sense, I think that Duolingo is actually easier because you can replay that audio before you record yourself. And the TOEFL is a little harder because you don't get that replay opportunity. You want to define two to three ideas in your opening lines. like. Kind of make a mental outline. It's gonna ask you for your opinion on something generally or what you think about something. So you're gonna to wanna to have two or three supporting reasons or ideas to talk about. And then you're gonna give an example for each one of those. Like you wanna say this is my idea, plus here's an example. Could be from your personal experiences, 
could be, you know, something you've seen on a movie or TV or whatever. Like, that's the ideas. Ideas, examples. I can. Choose a place you go to often that is important to you and explain why it is important. All right. I got this unlock. So a place that I go to that is important for me would probably be the Malecón and Miraflores. If there's a place that I would say I go to often, it would probably be that place. Uh, especially the Parque del Amor. It's the, the love park, as it's called in Spanish. And uh, I like that spot because I used to go there from time to time with some friends and just hang out. And it's one of the places that I used to go to a lot when I first came to Peru. Like, there was something about the place that brought me a lot of peace and tranquility. I have quite a few pictures of me in that place. When you get there, there's a mosaic. There's a, like, mosaic wall that runs around the edge of the park. And it's the perfect height and shape. It's curved. You can sit there on it and just sit back and kind of look out at the sea and see the sunset. And that's really cool to me that you can just kind of sit back Watch the sunset or watch it rise. Just enjoy the ocean breeze and the smell of the sea and the warm air flying up. And the other reason it's really important to me is like I've spent some really cool moments with some very cool people there. There's some people who were very close to me who I've spent a lot of time with in this place. Uh, even people who are guests who visit me or tourists that I meet, I take them there. I'm always like, just let's spend, you know, half an hour here because it's such a chill place and it's really good for taking pictures. So I think that's the thing is like I've spent a lot of time there and every time I go back, I feel the same sense of calm and peace and everybody who I take there enjoys it and it's always very memorable. So I think that's a place that I would consider important to me. Again. What characteristics do you think make someone a good parent? Explain why these characteristics are important to you. Okay, it's an interesting question. Here we go. All right, so again, I want to have two or three ideas and kind of like, you know, structure my answer around those ideas. So, so I think good parents have a couple of key characteristics. First is that they have to be loving and genuinely interested in their children. But also I think they have to have a level of maturity that's really important. We often assume on that topic of maturity that just because someone's an adult, they're more mature. Just because they have kids, they're more mature. They're more responsible. But that's not necessarily true. Lots of people have kids unexpectedly. They have kids even though they didn't really want to or just because it was social pressure telling them that it was the right time to have kids or at their age, they should have kids. And I think a lot of parents have children without really being emotionally ready to do that. I think they're not always mature. They're not always ready. And I think that that creates a lot of problems for their children. Like if somebody is going to bring a person into this world, they should absolutely have their life organized and be ready and have, you know, their finances in order and things too. I don't think it's right to bring someone into the world only to give them a bad life. And I think that the love component obviously is like a mandatory component of being a parent. Like if you're going to be a parent, you need to love your kid. Like you're, everyone deserves to feel loved. Everyone deserves to have that kind of close relationship in their life. And it's not right for someone to grow up without that. So I think those two things are really connected. Like if you're prepared and you're ready and you understand the commitment that is having a child, then you probably will provide them with a loving environment and it will be a good experience for them growing up. If you're not ready, if you're not mature, then you might still love your kid, but you might not know how to show that love. You might not be ready for that. And I think that that is why I think love and maturity are like the two most important things for parents. Everything else you can figure out as you go. I'm gonna hear that Imagine your life 10 years in the future. Talk about one way you think your life will be different in 10 years than it is now. All right. That's a pretty deep question. <laughs> okay. So 10 years in the future... It's kind of a scary thought because like a lot can happen in 10 years. I think the main difference in my life will probably be where I find myself. I expect myself to be traveling more in 10 years and to be 
in more places. Right now, I think I'm in that phase of my life where it's like the grind, where I have to work really hard, save up some money, pay off this house, and then have more freedom later. And I think that that's part of life, that you have to sometimes work through some phases that take a lot of effort, and you won't necessarily want to get up and go to work every single day. But I hope that like in 10 years from now, I have more of that freedom. I think I'll have the freedom to travel more, to work from wherever I want, to explore the world more and not be tied down necessarily to a day job because I see my company growing, I see my other options expanding and I see myself wanting to explore those options. And I think that once I have accumulated a little bit of wealth and capital and I've been able to like pay off this place, then I have that freedom to say, yeah, I can take a few months off of work. Yeah, I can go travel for a year. Yeah, I can go like run my business from somewhere else. Maybe for, you know, I'll spend a year in Japan and, and run my business there. I could do that. That's all stuff that could happen in 10 years. And I think that in order for that to happen, I have to really like work hard right now. Even the days I don't want to, even the moments where it's difficult, because like, that is the key is hard work. If you put in the hard work, you get the reward. And then eventually, you know, you can get done early. I don't know that I'll be able to retire in 10 years, but I think I'll at least have a more dynamic, exciting life in 10 years because of the work that I'm putting in today. Again, thank you everybody for checking it out. And I hope you have a great day.